right, right. In three, we are live. Okay, good morning and welcome to the Peter Scheim Academic Exposition. Uh, this is the interdisciplinary poster session uh, for a study abroad and interdisciplinary posters. Uh, we're going to have presentations uh, this afternoon, uh, this morning, I'm sorry. And uh, we're going to start with our study abroad. Uh, and Bob is going to start us out on our presentations. I would ask that the audience uh, mute their microphones. Uh, there will be a question time, and that will be the time for you to have your mic on when you ask a question. Thank you. Bob? Uh, okay, we, could we see his uh, PowerPoint, please? Um, Can you share, share it? There should be a little box with an arrow that. Okay, uh, it in, should. I click that. It should be up. Is that up now? Is, is you, it have to you have to select the share button. So once you'll be prompted to share, then once you click share, it'll say, "Do you want to share the item that you select?" Would you like me to upload it or share it? Or a burger. You don't want me to do it, but I could too. <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. If somebody could, yeah, I did. Okay, thank you. Show that, then I can just talk and I'll let you know when to advance. All right. Uh, good morning. My name is Bob Mulligan. Um, welcome to doing business in India, spring 2020. Um, this was a group of Paul Duffy. Uh, Matt Cran, Bob Mulligan, Robert Smith, and Jared Williams. Um, and we were hosted by uh, Dr. Amar throughout our trip to India. Um, next slide, please. All right, uh, good. Um, our trip began the moment it was canceled. Seton Hall University, out of concern, for coronavirus notified Dr. Amar that all trips would be canceled as we taxied, but we were in motion, so the trip was allowed to go. We were on a huge plane carrying about 25% of its capacity, so we were able to stretch out and relax on the 14-hour flight. Um, an excerpt from student Jared Williams' journal. In my mind, I expected the Mumbai airport to be a chaotic and loud mix of passengers, taxis, buses, police, and vendors. I was surprised at how calm the airport was. Getting through customs was a breeze. It was very quiet and our tour guide and new best friend Rohit escorted us to an, our air conditioned van to head to the hotel. My initial observations in Mumbai from our drive. It's hot and humid, it's 88 degrees at our arrival. Lots of traffic, the cars, buses, trucks, rickshaws and motorcycles all jockey for space. There do not appear to be traffic rules. The stratification of wealth is shocking. Modern high rise buildings, are surrounded by huts and shacks. Um, street pedestrians appear 90% male. Very few women and almost all women are escorted by a male companion. The purpose of doing business in India is to gain an understanding and appreciation of the economic structure, business opportunities, and cultural environments in one of the world's most dynamic countries. Next slide, please. Um, why consider doing business in India? The GDP, purchasing power parity, population, and number of English speakers are all strong reasons for companies to consider India. In addition, India has a young, educated workforce. India's aggressive goal is 99% literacy by 2025. India's population is 1.38 billion and should pass China to become the world's most populated by 2027. India continues to invest heavily in infrastructure such as highways, bridges and ports, as well as industrial corridors to ease transport of goods from manufacturing hubs and technology centers to ports for international distribution. The next slide. <clears throat> uh, our second day began with a trip to Pharma Labs, an Indian company that does business throughout the world. 
Our gracious host was Jay Shaw, Stillman MBA alum and director at Pharma Labs. A different senior sales manager gave us an excellent presentation titled Why India, which outlined many of the projects and initiative that Prime Minister Modi's government has undertaken in an effort to make India a great place to do business. Examples are Skilling India, which is a vocational and technology program, literacy initiatives, as well as programs aimed at moving goods into and out of and around India, as well as reducing corruption. Over the course of the next several days, we were fortunate to talk to leaders of industry like Bupresh Dunasia at Inox Corporation, a diversified company involved in chemicals, renewable energy, and even the theater business. We also had great interactions with leaders and educators from some of India's top business, management, and technology schools. Professor Rajiv Indamath of the Indian School of Management and Entrepreneurship presented a wonderful presentation to us titled, There is no such thing as doing business in India. He wanted us to realize that people doing business in India only focus on big cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, while they should also focus on Bharat, the remaining 32 rural regions of India. At the JP Business School, Professor Purankar presented an ease of doing business summary as recently issued by the World Bank. Next slide. Meeting with so many talented and successful individuals was impressive, but the student group was also lucky enough to receive firsthand experience of Indian culture. We toured Varanasi, which was a highlight for many, one of the highlight, oldest continually inhabited communities in the world to witness the centuries old Hindu traditions that take place along the Ganges River. We walked the grounds of India's government headquarters, visited Gandhi's for former residence, his site of assassination, and even his memorial in New Delhi. Next slide. We toured one of the new seven wonders of the world, the Taj Mahal in Agra. In Mumbai, we saw the world's most expensive house valued at $2 billion, but also some of its poorest communities. Next slide. Our small group walked away with a deeper appreciation for the wonderful people of India. We experienced several religions we had little or no experience to previously. The five of us will take our India experience with us as we go out into the workforce, and it will give us each a better sense of our international partners. And last slide. There are thousands of books about India, but the only way to really understand the country, the people, the businesses, and the culture is through a visit. The sights, sounds, and extraordinary tastes of India can only truly be appreciated through a tangible visit. And that is my presentation. And then uh, we have members of the group available if people have questions. Okay, so many of my class are business majors and uh, they probably should have questions about this uh, program where you are able to study abroad as well as on the experiences. Uh, I'm Anthony Vashiana. Should I show my uh, camera? Or? You, you may if you wish, Anthony. Hi. Uh, how how do you uh, join this process? Like I, I'm interested in it. Like what's the process of uh, going through with it? Okay. Would you like me to answer or one of uh, you who are here? I can see. Um, I. I, I can answer um, or you can. Um, I was lucky enough to have Dr. Amar's class and so he discussed it in his class. Um, we also, I, it was in um, the weekly update sent out from the Stillman School, um, just information about doing business in India. Dr. Mar Amar um, recruits pretty heavily for the class. I, well, he puts out a good word and then I think the trip kind of sells itself, honestly, but. Um, this, was, uh, this was our 12th trip to India, uh, 12th continuous. And somehow we have survived for 12 years. Mm -hmm. It is uh, just mainly because 
every student who went to India uh, on this trip with us had such an experience that they become our messengers, our ambassadors. I would say uh, if you are interested, uh, like Anthony is asking me, but anyone who is listening, if you are interested, mostly in October, once the semester settles down, we send out uh, kind of announcements. And if you are interested at that time, uh, maybe in a, a couple of weeks after that, we will say make a deposit. Typically a couple of hundred dollars will hold your seat and then uh, you, you would just be making a 50% deposit around uh, the end of the year, maybe Christmas time or so, and then remaining 50% when the next semester begins. Uh, ordinarily, we have kept the cost the same for four years in a row, and I think it will definitely be the same or even maybe a little lower based on how maybe deflation is occurring in the travel industry. Um, thank you. Uh, I did have a question. Uh, Bob and any of the other presenters in your group, uh, you mentioned that business is mainly concentrated in the big cities. And yes, I thought of Mumbai uh, when you uh, mentioned this trip, but I can't understand why American um, business is not interested in going into the other areas. I mean, business is business. It's about making a profit. So what are the obstacles to setting up um, business or trade in these other areas of India? You mind if I take this one to start? Sure. Yeah. So the biggest thing that we discussed um, just with the starting to do business in the rural parts of India is that every hundred miles you go, the culture drastically changes um, from what people eat to how they communicate different, like um, just they're completely different cultures. So when you're tackling uh, going into the more rural parts, you have to know about those cultures rather than just the urban cultures. And the farther you want to go in rural India, the more you have to specify your approach to uh, how they handle things specifically. So it's a lot of research and a lot of um, you need basically need people on the inside who understand how everything works and a lot of um, a lot of companies just don't want to uh, put that much effort in that they can tackle a large percentage of the population in the cities with doing less work so that's what's been holding people back it's part of what's been holding people back okay so Rob, Rob, it's very right i would also add there was there were also infrastructure issues Big cities had infrastructure, and then uh, industries like to locate closer to the uh, uh, sea because they know a lot of their products would be exported. And that is why uh, Mumbai had been a big city for business. Calcutta is another, but uh, Kolkata uh, is more like influenced by the thinking of uh, Little, little bit socialism, whereas uh, Mumbai and uh, Gujarat and Maharashtra and, and other parts of India are extremely capitalistic. So uh, like Rob said, things change. Every 100 miles or so you go, um, eating habits are different. Language uh, may, may be the same, but vernacular is different and that makes communication uh, hard. Now look at this. Of the 20 top cities in the world in terms of population, 14 are in India. So this means a big part of Indian population is really urban population. And uh, as you go to the countryside, most you will see farms. And in, in, uh, people could never imagine there will be so much agriculture in India. And so uh, definitely, those are some of the reasons why and the universities, good colleges, educated population, uh, advanced uh, 
technologies are more available in the big cities. So th those are some of the reasons. Thank you, Dr. Amar, and especially for relating the answer to the geology of the country and the culture. That's, that is very interesting. Uh, any other questions for these presenters on their experiences, perhaps the foods they got to eat, the people they got to meet, not just the business aspects? Can I ask? Uh, of course. Um, well, yeah, I'm interested to know, like, what, like, is it really like a culture shock, like, what is like you first get there like what is your first impression how did that change like while you were there rob or bob uh, uh okay yeah go ahead. go ahead uh yeah so <clears throat> this is uh paul duffy here oh, um hi, paul. Of, hello <laughs> uh one of the things that we uh first noticed in mumbai was that um there's there's like a huge like disparity between incredibly wealthy and incredibly poor like all within the the city so like the hotel that we stayed at was like one of the nicest in the entire city and like driving towards it you're passing like these incredibly poor neighborhoods they they reminded me of um the favelas in rio de janeiro like tin tin roofs concrete walls like very bare minimum kind of thing and we're just like driving past that to go to like this luxurious five-star hotel so that was one of the things that definitely kind of shocked me about it was that there's like so many rich and so many poor people living in such close proximity as like compared to america where there's generally like poor towns and rich towns and they're like more separated in that kind of way even in the city, it uh, it wasn't separated into like poor sections or rich sections. It was like you would see giant high rise buildings and then like a, a small grouping of uh, like very run down homes. And then like as you would drive through the city, it was like high rises, small small homes and like just scattered throughout the city. It, w it wasn't like in the center, it was rich and then the farther out you go uh the uh, wealth depleted it was just it was scattered that's very interesting uh i'm sure the whole class wants to know what was a multi-billion dollar home looks like in in india or anywhere in the world it, it was um i believe it's 27 stories tall it has um multiple levels that have gardens has 168 parking spots i believe um it has a snow room um is it's silly I, it's just over over abundance with one one family which makes it a very controversial thing in india for one family to live in such such wealth <clears throat> uh, and what right. I, did you know the business these people were in to be able I to I believe it's telecommunications. It is owned by Ambani uh, and Mukesh Ambani. In, in fact, he is the richest man in Asia. And it is his father who was actually a refugee after India's partition. Uh, what area became Pakistan? He left Pakistan and came to India as a refugee and started from the footpath opening his small entrepreneurship there and slowly and slowly he became very rich and then he gave a lot of that wealth and uh, ambition to his sons uh, Mukesh and Anil and both are now multi-billionaires and they are like Bob said in telecommunication but they are in several industries shipping anything you name and that and that is how uh, anyone becomes filthy rich when you go into various diversified industries. Thank you. Um, that is really fascinating. Uh, and any other questions from the students today or other guests? 
Well, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Uh, and I hope this continues in the future because you have always been a part of our interdisciplinary study abroad poster session. It's always one of the most popular uh, ones when we get our reviews. So I'd like you to uh, thank our presenters. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And it thank was a pleasure uh, to be here and and in fact, a kind of little reunion of our doing business in India 2020. I, I really yes. thank you. Thank you. All right. So I don't see that our next presenter has uh, entered the session, but I would like if Burke could put up uh, Hannah's poster so at least we can see her research. If possible. Is Burke still with us? Oh, there it is. OK, so um, as you can see, Hannah has done her research in Lake Apacon on algae blooms and the like. Um, she was able to take many samples uh, over last summer, and this is an ongoing research project of hers. Uh, she will be continuing her research this uh, summer again, uh, I guess if she's allowed to go to the lake. Um, she found that uh, this was in the news, that this algae bloom was so uh, prevalent that it was causing uh, the light to be blocked out. In other words, the clarity went down, the turbidity went up, and as a result, there was a disruption in the food chain um, without the um, plants. Um, providing uh, these plants were taking so much oxygen from the water and blocking light to the lower uh, phytoplanktons. Uh, without that dissolved oxygen, this uh, can cause fish kills and eventually even eutrophication, in which case the lake itself does not support uh, life any longer. Um, yes, so um, she is working on um, methods to resolve this problem. Uh, the first is education. Uh, as you know, if uh, nitrogen and phosphorus enters uh, a fresh water source or a submarine water source, uh, this is a natural fertilizer to plants on land and it acts the same way uh, when you have uh, uh, them entering the water. It acts as a uh, growth boosting and the algae just reproduces uh, out of control in an exponential form. So by educating people not to introduce nitrogen, excess nitrogen into the environment uh, would help. For example, um, not using fertilizers on your lawns and uh, in your gardens, instead using native plants that are able to survive in that environment uh, so you don't have to add extra nutrients. Uh, also by um, planting vegetation that holds the soil down or using mulch to hold the soil down so that this doesn't run off into the water, um, causing more problems and entering more nitrogen into the water source. There's also the problem of animal waste. In many communities, there are large populations that are protected since they're an endangered species of the Canadian geese. Um, I'm sure some of you see these in your communities if you have a pond or lake. They no longer migrate. Uh, they have enough food. Our temperatures are warm enough. So instead of flying from Canada down to southern states, they remain in New Jersey year round. And of course, uh, as they eat, they produce waste. This waste is high in nitrogen. And uh, then as it decomposes, this enters the water. The same would be true if you did not pick up the waste after your pets, uh, which you should if you're walking them, but some people do not, or from stray animals. Uh, so this is an extra source that uh, adds nitrogen to the water. So by educating the public, uh, hopefully there would be a reduction in the excess nitrogen uh, infiltrating into the water. Um, the, the town itself wants to also investigate methods 
uh, of reducing these algae blooms because not only do they cause a threat to the animals and uh, plants in the water, they're a threat to human beings. As you know, Lake Apacom was closed to recreational uh, bathing uh, and uh, boating uh, during this time. So as a result, it also has that economic component as well as affecting people in the area. So Hannah is going to continue this research uh, during the summer. Uh, does anyone have any questions that I could relate to her? In fact, this may relate to some of your case-based studies, actually. No one? Mark, yes? I have a question for you. Yes. Can I go on? Yes, please. Okay. Anyone can ask a question. Uh, I have found from uh, watching news and reading some articles that somehow if we oxygenate such areas, uh, we'll see algae uh, go away or disappear. And in many cases, they found out even um, the area, the water, the soil became uh, productive. Uh, how would you respond to that? That is correct. In many places, you will now see um, actual fountains or ways of adding oxygen to the um, water. In ponds and lakes, often the water becomes stagnant. Uh, naturally, you get oxygen into the water by wave action. As the water goes up and over, it actually dissolves oxygen into the water and plants themselves add oxygen to the water. In these cases of the algae blooms, there are so much algae that it causes the problem. So yes, oxygenation of the water is one of the methods that can be used, uh, especially in contained areas. In large areas, it's more difficult to implement, but that is a way of um, remediating the problem. Uh, and I know some of my students are doing research just on this case. Are there any plants perhaps that could be added that would decrease the algae or any organisms, animals that could help decrease the algae blooms uh, by um, introducing them into the uh, water source? No one? Thank you. Yes? My students are not forthcoming. Um, yes, so sometimes there are, um, they try to use native species because alien species adding um, bacteria, monorans, or um, adding uh, fish that would help or uh, plants like lilies that would help in this case, uh, they can then overtake the natural species and cause an imbalance. But if you can introduce something that will actually um, ink algae and uh, reduce the population that can be used in conjunction with adding dissolved oxygen. Thank you, Dr. Amar, for your insight. Okay. So if there are no other questions for our poster presenters, uh, this will end that part of the session. Um, I'm going to uh, speak to the other the students in the class at the moment. Uh, at this point, you are going to be asked to um, present and share, and it's a sharing, uh, some of the research you're doing to your case-based studies that uh, your final projects are due May the 7th. So this is a preliminary work in progress report. I have been told by Burke that you are able to share an image. So if you do have an image that you would like to share that relates to your project, uh, please do so. You do not have to appear on camera uh, and you can remain anonymous if that is something you wish to do when you're giving your uh, sharing your information. The information that you are supposed to share as a reminder is uh, the case, the specific location of your case, the causes, effects, and if you found one possible solution. Are there any questions? Sorry about that. Okay, so our first group, uh, and remember to turn on your mic when you're speaking. Uh, the same if you have questions for the students. Um, 
would be, is Marissa here? Marissa? I am here, yes. Okay, Marissa, what is your topic? What are you working on? Um, I'm working on water quality. Um, oh, geez. Sorry. Oh, um, I'm fine. working on water quality um, at the South Branch um, Road and River in, in, um, in um, sorry, I'm getting all these notifications from the chat, um, in uh, Clinton, New Jersey. Um, so I, um, I actually did research um, on there or in the river um, for another class. And the issue is um, high runoff and nitrate levels uh, um, with an addition to high phosphate levels. Um, and the cause of this 